Okay, let's get started. Um, today's lecture would win the uh, prize for me for uh, highest degree of regret that we don't have a live audience. Uh, this is a lecture that's usually a lot of fun when the audience is here. Obviously, we uh, can't do that, so we'll do the best we can uh, in, under the circumstances. Um, we, for the question of the day, with sports versus video games, uh, kind of uh, uh, somewhat close uh, there. Um, I mentioned that I'm going to be releasing information about the midterm on Monday, so I'll talk more about that on uh, Monday. I am releasing a homework five today. I've already put the information up on the web page. Um, there will not be a homework six going out next week because it's normally when we have our midterm. So uh, this is the last assignment you know, before the midterm. On Monday, as I said, I'm gonna release a bunch of materials about the midterm, but we're basically, you're basically gonna have a week uh, where there isn't a homework assignment out uh, that uh, will be the time that you can be working on the, on the midterm. And uh, I will uh, give you maximal flexibility in terms of where to fit in the, the midterm activity uh, over the next two weeks. So uh, let me switch to JGRASP. I was showing at the very end last time uh, this Sierpinski program. Uh, I was talking about the idea that if you did a level one Sierpinski, you just get a triangle. Uh, and then as you go up in levels, that it kind of repeats whatever the previous level's pattern was. So to go to level two, level one's a simple triangle. Level two involves a triangle up here, uh, it's centered. A, a triangle in the lower left and a triangle in the lower right. So if we, if we ran this again with a level two, you see those three different triangles. And then this figure would be something that would be drawn in three different places uh, if we go up a level to level three. And theoretically, the Sierpinski fractal uh, is uh, uh, infinitely many levels deep. Uh, these fractals are very... Uh, they're, they're, I mentioned that you kind of have to talk about them when you talk about recursion because uh, the, the phrase that people use to describe fractals is self-similar, uh, which is, you know, the, so recursion is a natural way of uh, defining these, uh, these fractals. Now, the Sierpinski, you know, theoretically is infinitely uh, many levels deep, but the uh, graphics can only draw it with so much accuracy. So that's a level eight Sierpinski. Uh, I did want to just kind of point out the code real quick. I posted this to the calendar on Wednesday, but the code that does this has a base case when level is one where it just draws a single triangle. And then in the recursive case, it computes the three midpoints that are involved here, uh, and it draws three different Sierpinski triangles of the lower level. An interesting thing about that is that the level one Sierpinski draws one triangle. Uh, level two draws three times as many triangles. Level three draws three times as many as that, so it draws nine triangles. The next level up uh, draws three times as many as that, 27 triangles. So this one has an exponential character to it in terms of how many triangles it draws. So recursion can lead to an exponential type uh, uh, result in terms of uh, how many times a method um, is called. So anyway, I just wanted to be, you know, we didn't have time last time we got cut off, so I didn't have a chance to talk about that. Uh, so uh, let's talk about what we're going to be doing for today's lecture. I um, uh, usually begin by mentioning uh, that this is going to be a lecture where we're going to be talking about linguistics. Uh, and I ask people, uh, why would computer scientists care about uh, linguistics? because we care about it a lot, actually. We study a lot about linguistics. And I get interesting answers, you know, you, you want to write Siri that can understand human beings and so forth. Uh, that's all true. There's a lot of places where uh, computer scientists are studying linguistics. But there's some very basic things that we know from the very beginning, computer scientists had to study linguistics. And uh, the, the, the main answer I'm looking for is that we design our own languages. Java is a language that we designed. All of these programming languages are languages that we designed. So we want to understand the properties of languages. We want to understand grammar. Uh, there's, so you'll find, uh, if you study computer science, uh, that you end up uh, seeing this quite a bit, you know, kind of the, the understanding of linguistics. 
And it's the theme of this kind of programming assignment we're going to do. I'm going to say a little bit about that uh, uh, in a few minutes. So uh, uh, we have um, a bit of extra time today, in a sense. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is use that as a chance to talk about something a little bit extra. It's not something you're going to be tested on, but I think it's something that you'll find interesting. And it's something that we make use of in the homework assignment. You don't have to understand it in great detail uh, because the write-up is very clear about exactly how you're supposed to use uh, the, this linguistic construct I'm going to tell you about. But, you know, it's always nice to uh, explain it to you guys. You might find it interesting. I wanted to begin by pointing out uh, uh, an interesting way in which this comes up. Uh, so uh, I use a Mac. Maybe a lot of you guys use a Mac as well. You may not use this little terminal uh, command that you have available to you. But uh, uh, basically, if you own, if you own a, a Mac, then you own a Unix machine. And if you open up the terminal, then you're basically at a, at a command line interface, a Unix command line interface. And uh, you may have heard people talking about Unix. You know, the computer scientists designed Unix, and there's a lot of cool stuff in Unix. I'm going to show you a few things there that you might find somewhat interesting. One of them is that um, on every Unix machine, uh, if you give the command cd, which is to change your directory to a different directory, you should find that there's a directory called usr share dict. So I'm changing my directory to be this other directory, which is a standard directory that's included with uh, Unix, uh, no matter what uh, Unix uh, uh, version you have. Uh, there's a command ls that lets you see what's in a directory. And it's showing me the different things here. There's a file called readme. So maybe we'll, well, let's take a look at what readme says. So I can give a command to kind of see what's inside of this readme file. And it says, welcome to Web2, Webster's Second International, all 234,936 words worth. The 1934 copyright has lapsed, according to the supplier. So this is a typical Unix thing, is they want to have a dictionary, but they don't want to pay for it. So they kind of use one where where uh, there, there's no copyright that they have to worry about. So there's a file on this directory called words that has the, the Webster's um, dictionary. Uh, so you can see there's this thing here that's being listed called words. Uh, I could take a look at what's inside of words and you just see, you know, all of these different uh, words that are part of that Webster's dictionary. Um, there are various commands that you can give in Unix, uh, several of which uh, involve doing things um, that are related to what we're going to do today. So I want to talk to you uh, first about what are known as regular expressions. And there's a, there's a special command in Java known as grep, I'm sorry, not in Java, in Unix, known as grep. A lot of these Unix commands have strange names. You know, grep. Uh, the the re part of uh, grep is for regular expression. I think it's global regular expression print is what it's short for. But who cares? People call it grep. You know, uh, uh, it's a weird name, but uh, it's a it's an extremely useful um, command to be able to give. I, I probably average using grep at least once a week, maybe twice a week. I mean, it, it's it's one of the Unix commands that I use uh, most often. And the general form of grep is that you give it some pattern that you want to search for, and you give it some file to search for for that pattern. And we're going to be talking about these things called regular expressions, which are a way of describing a pattern. So uh, there's a lot of different kinds of patterns you could describe. Um, how about if I begin by just saying zing? Let me grep the pattern zing in words. The pattern zing is literally the character Z-I-N-G, and basically it's looking for lines of the file that have somewhere in that line the four letters Z-I-N-G. And if I hit enter, you can see there's a lot of zing words that are in that dictionary. So it's showing me all of the lines that had zing in it that match that pattern. Um, I'm going to give a slightly different command where I'm going to say minus W that's a, an extra flag that I can use to say that I want it, the pattern that I'm going to give, I want that to be the entire line. So like if I use zing for that, there's only going to be one thing that could match that, which would be a line that has zing by itself. So I'm, I, basically the W, the minus W is limiting it 
to, to lines that have exactly that pattern, nothing extra, no extra characters besides what's being described by the pattern. But let me give a different pattern here. I'm going to use dot, 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 dot. In the Unix version of regular expressions, you use a dot as a wild card to represent one character. So basically, the, the pattern dot, 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 dot represents four characters. You know, it's, basically, I'm asking for four-letter words. So I say, show me all of the complete lines from this file that match the pattern of four characters. Uh, and it's, the file is called words. I'm asking for all the four-letter words you know, that are in the file. So you can see, boom, all lots of four-letter words that are in this file. Uh, if, you, if you become um, uh, more comfortable with Unix commands, you'll learn all sorts of interesting things you can do. Like one of the things you can do is that you can take the output of one command and make it the input of another command. And the idea here, you, you put a little vertical bar character, which is known as the pipe character. So it's kind of, the, you know, it's somewhat of a plumbing model, like we've discussed in some other cases. The idea is that I'm, I'm giving the grep command, and there's some output being produced by it. So I'm going to pipe that output as the input of another command. And the command I'm going to give is wc word count. So I'm going to basically take that output that I was getting here, and I'm feeding it into this the thing called WC, and it tells me that there's 5,274 four-letter words uh, in the dictionary. Uh, it'll, it's counting them for me. So you can do things like that. We can do things like, how about if I do Q dot 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 uh, in words? So here I'm being specific about the first character. I want the first character to be a Q, and then three other characters. So it's four-letter words that start with Q, and there's quite a few of them, actually. Uh, or I could give a pattern that would be, say, something like uh, four-letter words that start with a Q and end with a T. And the two in between are where I use a wild card that could be filled in with anything. So uh, we're, I'm using here you know, uh, regular expressions that are, that are describing a, a pattern that uh, different uh, lines of the input file can match, you know, different words can match. There's, uh, there's several words that match the pattern Q dot dot T, and it's showing them to me here. That's what grep does, is it shows me those, those different words. Um, I, I, I watch Jeopardy sometimes, and I've always found it kind of interesting when they have a category that's something like 16 letter words. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. And I find myself wondering, are there that many 16-letter words? Or how about 18-letter words, or 19-letter words, or 20-letter words? Well, how about if we do 20? I'll stop there. Usually I ask the audience, you know, how many letters do you want me to use? And we can kind of take a look. Are there any 20-letter words in the dictionary? And it turns out there's quite a few, uh, including unproportionableness and unextinguishableness. Uh, words that I use almost every day in, the, in the, uh, my uh, interactions with students. Uh, anyway, uh, if you're interested, you can, you can play with these kinds of commands. If you, have a, if you have a Mac or if you have access to a Unix machine some other way, you can connect to this directory that has the dictionary, play around with the grep command. Now, I wanted to uh, kind of uh, make it clear that I'm just scratching the surface. These regular expressions are very useful, uh, and people uh, spend a lot of time studying how to do different kinds of regular expressions. We're just scratching the surface, just looking at a few simple examples. Uh, I thought a, a way of kind of demonstrating that is showing you that there's a book that's, that, that you can buy on Amazon called Mastering Regular Expressions, and if you scroll down and take a look, how, how many pages could it be to describe how to, how to master regular expressions? 544 pages. So there's a lot to know uh, about regular expressions, and we're doing just a tiny little bit of it here. Um, I'm gonna, I uh, in, am going to include some links for today in case you're interested uh, in pursuing this further. Maybe I will just kind of give you the caveat that Unix uses slightly different versions. Like I told you, the dot is what you use in a Unix uh, regular expression. It's slightly different in Java regular expressions. 
So anyway, if you're interested, I have some links where you, you know, there's a link to uh, uh, the Unix style regular expressions and a link to Java style regular expressions in case you get interested in what we're going to be doing, what I'm showing you here and what I'm about to show you in a minute. Okay, normally ask for questions, don't have the opportunity to ask for questions. So what I want to do next is show you, there's a little program I wrote for you called Splitter. And what Splitter does, so I'm gonna put this on the calendar for today. Uh, it, it, you know, it prompts the user for a regular expression, well, for some text that's gonna be split, and then for a regular expression to use for splitting it. And it reads in that regular expression, and this is kind of the key line of code that uh, it takes the input, that, uh, the text that the user has said to work with, and it calls a method called split. So the string class has a method called split, where you give it a regular expression, and it breaks up the string into a bunch of different strings based on the regular expression that you provided. Uh, and it returns that to you as an array of strings. So this program just shows you that. You know, uh, it's just kind of making a little more visible uh, the output of what split gives you. So if you want to play with split a little bit, uh, you can use this program to do it. Now, when we looked at scanners, you may remember that the scanner had something where if you called next, next, next on the scanner, it would read in one token and then skip white space and read in another token and skip white space. So I just kind of used that phrase, white space. You know, that's spaces and tabs and new line characters. It skips past those. It breaks up the file based on the white space. So we would say that the white space is being used as a delimiter, a delimiter, an indicator of the breaks, of kind of, you know, wh wh where uh, one token uh, begins and ends, you know, the white space is used to indicate that boundary. But, but basically, by using the split command, you can change the delimiter. So you can use a different delimiter to break up the string. Uh, and I think this will be a little clearer if we just run it for a little bit and take a look at some of these things. So let me run the program. Uh, how about if I give it a, a simple phrase with just spaces in between? Four score and seven years ago. So that's a, that's a string, yeah, some text. And uh, the usual thing we would use as a delimiter is space. You know, so we kind of say, well, look at the spaces. There's a space here, there's a space here. You know, so each of those different spaces. So I'm going to, I'm going to, you're not going to be able to see it because it's a, you know, invisible character, right? A space. But I just typed a space and I'm going to hit enter. And it's showing there that it's using the space as the expression. So space is the delimiter. And so using space as the thing to indicate the boundaries, it comes up with the tokens four score and seven years ago. Kind of what we would expect, right? There's no reason that you have to use space as a delimiter. You could use S as a delimiter. I mean, we wouldn't normally do that. It's a weird kind of thing to do. But basically what you'd be saying is that this S right here is indicating boundaries. So what comes before the S is, is the kind of the first token. What comes after it is the next token until it encounters another S. So uh, let's take a look, let me hit enter. And you can see we get four and then a space, and then it found that, that, that S, core and, and then a space, even year and ago. So the, the individual S characters were being used to indicate you know, where the breaks are. And notice that the delimiter is not included. There's no S's included in what we get back. Delimiters are normally thought of as just kind of indicating boundaries, but, but they don't tend to have to be preserved then. You know, well, like a space, obviously. The space just goes away. Here it's a little weirder because we're using the character S. I'm just kind of trying to point out that, you know, it's strange to use the character S, but there's no reason you can't. I mean, Java will do whatever you ask it to do in that regard. Uh, if I give it the letter E, what is it going to do? It's going to find a whole lot of characters before it encounters an E, uh, and then some other characters until it gets to this E, and then this E, and so forth. So let's just kind of see what we get. Four scar and ni ours ago. So it's using the E there uh, to break up the different, the different uh, uh, tokens that we would get. All right, well, let me... Uh, hit enter here, 
Let me run it again. And this time what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give it multiple spaces. So uh, I'm gonna type four, and then I'm gonna type one, two, three, four, five spaces, score one, two, three, four spaces. And uh, I guess I'm not gonna worry about these other ones so much. I just, you know, for the first two, I wanted to have a specific number of spaces and seven years ago. So suppose that I had that as my string. So uh, if I break it up on a space, I get a kind of an odd result. Notice I get four, and then I get a bunch of empty strings. Well, why did that happen? So let me try to explain what's going on here. Uh, it's, it basically said, you have told me that a single space is being used as the delimiter, as the indicator you know, of a boundary. So where does it find a single space? It finds one right here. And so what came before is considered a token. So that's why we get the word for. So far, so good. But then it says, OK, but where's the next occurrence of a single space? It's right next to it. There's two in a row. And so it says, well, if those are boundaries, it's, if each of those individual spaces is a boundary, then you must have had an empty token in between. That, you know, in between those two is emptiness, you know, and that's why it's showing you an empty string. And similarly, it finds yet another space that gives you an empty string, and yet another space that gives you an empty string, and yet another space that gives you an empty string. And it's only here, you know, when it finds this space over here, that it finds uh, what we would consider to be a real token, the word score, and then some more empty spaces. So when you deal with multiple spaces, that's trickier. The scanner's doing something, uh, uh, you know, that's not simple you know, in terms of skipping uh, more than one space, potentially. Let me just kind of show you, I mean, uh, you, could Im you might imagine you could do something like typing two spaces, but actually two spaces does something even a little weirder. So let me type in two spaces, and we still have some empty strings here, and now we've got a string that's actually got a space inside of it. Well, let's take a look at what we have here. So if I'm using two spaces, uh, it found a first occurrence of the two spaces here with the word for in front of it. And then it found another occurrence of two spaces here. And that's why it has an empty string, because they're two right next to each other. And then notice what it finds next is a single space followed by the word score. That's why that single space got absorbed uh, in that token, uh, because it's looking for uh, uh, the two spaces as the individual delimiters. So this is not the kind of thing that we want to do. Space space is not helpful. What we want to do is we want to say kind of an indefinite number of spaces, one or more spaces. And there's a way to say that with regular expressions. I'm going to type the, a space, and then I'm going to type a plus. Plus has a special meaning in regular expressions. And what it, the meaning is whatever came before the plus, you're asking for one or more of those. So, you know, space plus, that's the regular expression that I'm using here, space plus means one or more spaces. And so notice now I've got four score and seven years ago. Now it's proper, coll properly collapsing those sequences of spaces uh, using that regular expression uh, space plus. Usually at this point, I get somebody in the audience who asks me, they say, well, if plus has this special meaning, then how do you get an actual plus? And so there, there needs to be some kind of a quoting mechanism. As I said, I'm only kind of telling you a little bit about regular expressions here, not all the different details. But basically, you, you would do a backslash plus in order to be able to describe an actual plus. Uh, so that's, that's that two-character sequence. We've seen this before with escape sequences. That would be a way of describing uh, a, a regular old plus, not plus being used in this special meaning. Uh, that would mean that backslash, backslash, you need to have two of them in order to describe a single backslash. So anyway, there's a lot of little details for things like that. Uh, in fact, if you had, what would backslash plus plus indicate? Uh, backslash plus, it mean, th that two character sequence indicates a regular plus character, and then putting a plus after that says one or more regular plus characters. So that's kind of sequences of pluses. Uh, okay, so uh, that's, but that's basically what I wanted to do with that example. Let me run again. 
and I wanted to uh, give it something that involves tabs. Tabs are not understood well by uh, most novices and even by a lot of computer scientists. Tabs are weird. Um, I mean, they, the, the origin of the tabs is when we, uh, typewriters, I mean, I took a typing class in high school where you'd be typing along, and when you hit the tab key, there were predefined columns that it would go to. So it would scooch over to the next tab stop. You know, and that's still kind of how tabs are understood, but it, it, it has a special status that you need to understand. So I'm gonna type four tab, score tab, and tab seven tab years tab ago. And so it may, it may seem weird, like here, how come there's only the one space here? And here there seems to be more spaces, here there are more spaces. Well, how the tab uh, involved text gets displayed is something that's kind of varies from one program to another. So basically, uh, JGRASP is deciding how to display this. If you're using the default settings in JGRASP, JGRASP uses every three spaces as tab stops uh, for, for, the, for regular tabs. I have set it so that it's every four. So it does have in mind particular columns that are kind of the, you know, every four, uh, uh, every four spaces, you know, is a new column. And so when you hit the tab key, it goes to the next column. So uh, the next tab column, the next tab stop. So sometimes you're far away from that. You know, sometimes it has to scooch over quite a bit to get to that, ne that column that's the next tab stop. Sometimes it's right next to it, and so it doesn't seem to scooch over very far at all. But let me hit enter. Uh, I mean, what you might imagine, I mean, I, I, I'm gonna split it on a space. And you might imagine that we're gonna get something like we got before with lots of empty spaces and so forth. You know it's not gonna work, but uh, at least it'll, it'll break it up somewhat, but there'll be kind of those empty strings. Well, it turns out it didn't break it up at all. There's no spaces in that string. There's not a single space in that string. So one of the things that's hard to understand is that tab is a special character. Uh, and you can kind of see an indication of that. If I, if I use my cursor here and I select characters, F-O-U-R, what's the next character it's going to select? Now, you'd think that it's gonna kind of go just over one space, but take a look at what happens when I move my cursor. Nothing, 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 and then there it is. There's, that, there's one character there that's a tab character that's kind of moving me over to here, and then a bunch of these other characters. This is also, let me move my cursor, I'm just kind of scooching it over. That is a single character right there. It looks like multiple characters, but it's not. It's a single character that's a tab character. And that one looks like a space, but it's actually a tab. Uh, and then that's a single tab character, and that's a single tab character, because that's what I typed. You know, when I typed it, I, I typed one tab in between each of those things. Well, so what that means is that if I hit tab here as the, the expression I wanted to use, then it breaks it up perfectly, four score and seven years ago, because there's exactly one tab between each of those uh, different things. Uh, so uh, it's a little weird to kind of type a tab character. It's a little hard to, to read or to know that that's a tab character. So there's a special version of this backslash T uh, is an escape sequence that indicates a tab character. I mean, you can type a real tab if you want, but backslash T is what we would normally use. Uh, and then it's breaking it up into the four score and seven years ago. This regular expression, by the way, breaking it up with backslash T, is a useful expression to use if you're working with Excel. Uh, if you have an Excel file, uh, one of the options is to save it as a tab delimited file. Uh, if you save your Excel spreadsheet as a tab delimited file and then take the individual lines of the file and do a call on split using the tab, it breaks it up into the columns, you know, the different elements, you know, that were in the spreadsheet column by column. Uh, because that's what tab delimited means, is that there's a tab in between the, each different value from the cells, you know, uh, that, that in the tab delimited output, there's one tab in between uh, each of the different uh, uh, cell values. All right, so that's what I wanted to show you for the tab. I wanna get to the point where we can have combinations of spaces and tabs, but you can't see them, you know, and you, and you particularly can't tell the difference between spaces and tabs. So I'm gonna use 
uh, dashes and spaces instead of tabs and spaces. So I'm going to have four score space space dash 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 space dash space dash and uh, space seven dash dash space space dash years dash ago. So it's a combination of spaces and dashes that I've put here. And so I can ask it to do things like space plus one or more spaces, and that breaks up this thing somewhat, but it doesn't break up the things that involve the dashes, but it's kind of sort of breaking it up. Uh, I can use dash plus as the way to say one or more dashes, and that kind of breaks up different parts of it, but then leads to things that have spaces and so forth, so that's not quite right. What I want to say is combinations of spaces or dashes. And there's a way to say that in regular expressions as well. I can use the square bracket notation, and I can say space dash. So inside of square brackets, I put the two characters, space and dash, and that's understood to be an or, either a space or a dash. And so if I, if I do space dash plus, that's saying one or more of spaces or dashes, and now I get my four score in seven years ago. So that's kind of a very useful expression to use uh, when, you, uh, when you have more than one kind of character that you're looking for. All right, well, let me try typing in then kind of the thing I was looking for, which is for tab space, tab tab, space space, score, tab tab, and space space space, seven set, uh, space, years tab ago. So combinations of spaces and tabs. So again, space plus doesn't do quite what I want backslash T plus doesn't do quite what I want, but if I have space backslash T, so a space or a tab plus, that's the expression that's gonna kind of say one or more spaces or tabs. And this is an expression I've asked you to use uh, in your homework solution. So this kind of skips you know, sequences of spaces and tabs uh, within a line. Uh, it's, it, so it, it kind of ignores the white space, spaces and tabs. All right, I'm gonna do just one more example just to show you something that can be a little bit tricky. This, and then I'm gonna type a bunch of special characters. Isn't, uh, and how about a bunch of commas? Going, uh, maybe a bunch of digits, uh, to uh, equals 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 B, uh, a bunch of ampersands, easy with some exclamation marks. So, okay, pretty complicated text there. This isn't going to be easy. Uh, I, I want to break up this, this string, and I want to pull the words out. Now, I'm going to do something that seems weird at first. I'm going to try to erase the words, which seems like the opposite of what I want to accomplish, but you'll see why in a second. So if I wanted to kind of describe the words as, as the delimiters and have the words be the thing that disappear, uh, I could have inside of my square brackets, I could say A, B, C, D, E, F, G. I could mention all the different, you know, uh, letters, uh, A through Z. Well, there's a way to do that that's kind of, you know, the dash has this special meaning here when it's in between two characters, A through Z, that I can say kind of any, you know, that's, that represents 26 characters, A dash Z. And I'm saying one or more of those. And it got rid of a lot of the letters, but it didn't get rid of the capital letters. So how about if I do A dash Z and then A dash Z? So I kind of do the lowercase letters and the capital letters uh, and do that plus. Now it's getting rid of all of those. And you might say, well, that's the opposite of what I wanted to do, but there's a special thing with, the, with this square bracket notation, which is if the first character inside the square brackets is an up arrow, that's understood to mean either not, or you can think of it, if you think about sets, as complement. So it's basically kind of saying not an A to Z, A to Z, or if you think of sets, the complementary set, the, you know, the, the set that's, that's everything that's not A to Z, A to Z. So that turns out to get me the words. This isn't going to be easy. And if I wanted to include the apostrophe in there, I could kind of change this so that it has the apostrophe as well. And now I've kind of pulled out the words, this isn't going to be easy. So that's an example of a very complex 
regular expression that you can use. Um, I wanted to mention just one last thing uh, before we, we move on, which is that, uh, you know, we've been using Scanner. Scanner's very helpful. Scanner has a method called use delimiter. So you can specify a regular expression for a scanner to use. Like if you use that tab, then that would be useful for reading Excel files. If you use this regular expression, it would do a really good job of finding words and ignoring other kinds of characters like, like periods and commas and other kinds of punctuation. So uh, the scanner is very powerful in that way, that that's another place where regular expressions can come into play, that you can specify a regular expression for the delimiter that the scanner uses. Okay, well that's what I wanted to say about regular expressions. What I want to do next is to tell you about your homework assignment. So your homework assignment, uh, I mentioned that we're doing linguistics, you're going to be looking at what are known as BNF grammars. BNF grammars allow you to express more than what regular expressions express. So you can express more complicated uh, 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 grammars than what you can do with simple regular expressions. These BNF grammars, uh, well, let me show you, uh, there's a, uh, 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 I looked up before class, you know, the Wikipedia entry for what's known as a parse tree. Uh, what we're doing here can be thought of as kind of parsing, what's called parsing. You know, that, well, so like they have a great example here in the middle of this page where they're kind of showing you a derivation here of how do we know that John hit the ball is grammatically correct in English. Well, so what it's kind of showing you is uh, a derivation. A sentence is composed of a noun followed by a verb phrase. A verb phrase is a verb followed by a noun phrase. A noun phrase can be a determiner followed by a noun. And then these different elements could be John hit the ball. So this is an example of a sentence derived from a BNF grammar. Uh, in these BNF grammars, you'll notice that there are words like John hit the ball that are actual words you'd expect to speak. We refer to those as terminals. So it, has, it mentions here the idea of terminals and non-terminals. This is an important distinction to understand. Terminals are words in the language, things you would actually expect to say to someone, like John hit the ball. Uh, these non-terminals are variables like S or N or VP that are used to describe the grammar, but they're, they're used kind of internally. They're not meant to be things that you would actually speak or write. I mean, if I walked up to someone on the street and I said, John hit the ball, they might think I'm weird for saying it, but at least they would kind of understand what I said. But if I said, mm, vup, you know, they would have no clue what I'm talking about. So these, these non-terminals are things that we're not actually going to say. Uh, these are the things, the terminals are things we're actually going to say. So these BNF grammars, it's short for Bacchus Nauer form, uh, named after a couple of people from the 1950s who, who pioneered this uh, description of grammars. Uh, they begin uh, on the left-hand side with a non-terminal. So like S, for example, could be a non-terminal. There's a convention uh, in linguistics that we often put a less than, greater than around a non-terminal so that it's more obvious that it's a non-terminal. That's actually not a rule that we're going to follow in this program. Uh, but I'm doing it for this version of the grammar to make it a little easier for you to spot the non-terminals. But so uh, BNF grammars are, are, are presented as a series of rules. So basically we have, we have a bunch of different uh, uh, rules for different non-terminals. So I would say that uh, an S is composed of, the colon colon equals is kind of understood to be is composed of. And on the right hand side, I, I describe a rule. So I'm going to say a sentence uh, is composed of a noun phrase followed by a verb phrase. So I have to kind of describe what that is. I'll say that a noun phrase is composed of, there's a lot of things it could be, but for now, how about if I say that it could be a proper noun? Normally at this point, uh, uh, I ask the class, please give me some proper nouns, you know, so that way it could be fun. You guys can can uh, provide your own input to it. Uh, we didn't have the chance to do that, so I had posted something. I mentioned this last time. So a little over 50 of you uh, took advantage of filling out this catalyst form. 
So you gave me a bunch of proper nouns. So I'm gonna make a copy of what you guys provided and I'm gonna paste that in here. So I'm gonna have a rule for a sentence, noun phrase, and proper noun. I'm gonna to get to the verb phrase, but not just yet. I'm gonna kind of leave that alone for now. Now, I, I don't wanna have this in here because this isn't part of the grammar. And let me tell you that I did something to make this a little easier for you, is that you know, the, you're gonna read an input file that has these kinds of rules, one per line, and I've said that there's not gonna be even a space uh, after this non-terminal. So, they, so there, you don't even have to worry about having a little space there that would be in front of the colon, colon equals. Uh, now, and remember what I said is there's terminals and non-terminals. Uh, I'm, I'm putting the non-terminals inside less than, greater than, but that's not what your program is gonna pay attention to. What your program is gonna do is it's gonna say that by definition, anything that appears on the left-hand side of one of these lines of input is a non-terminal. So this is gonna understand S and NP and PN to be non-terminals. But I don't have a rule yet for VUP, so it's gonna be considered a terminal. So it's gonna make a mistake for now, which is it's gonna think that's something that you can actually utter. Uh, notice there's something that's going on here as well, which is that there are these little vertical bar characters. The understanding of this is that we're saying that a proper noun can be Tokyo, or, think of that as the word or, it can be Neil Armstrong, and that's understood to be two different terminals, Neil and Armstrong. We're kind of using spacing as a way to break this up into individual tokens. Or it can be Isaac Asimov, or it can be Bernie Sanders. You know, so that's kind of what this rule right here is saying. So let me save this file, and I'm gonna come over here, I've got, a. Uh, a grammar main, uh, this, you'll be able to run this when you finish the homework assignment. So I'm gonna have it read from fun.txt, and it says that it knows about three non-terminals, N, P, P, N, and S. Remember, the rule that it uses is things that appear on the left-hand side you know, of one of these lines of input. Those are the things that are considered non-terminals. So again, as I said, VP, it's a mistake basically that it doesn't realize that that's a non-terminal but that's because we didn't put it into the grammar yet. But we'll get there, we'll put it into the grammar. So you get to choose, how about if I say noun phrase? How about if I say generate, you know, randomly generate five noun phrases for me? So I get Wilson, Pepperidge Farm, Garfield, Vasselheim, and Mars. Uh, I could say, well, how about, give me some sentences. How about if we generate five sentences? So we get Johnny Bravo, whoop, Johnny Bravo, whoop, Ludwig Ogren, whoop, Pepperidge Farm, VUP, and Washington, VUP. So again, you know, we gotta fix that, but we'll get to that in a second, uh, that that's not an actual uh, non-terminal. All right, but I wanted to kind of improve on what I had for what a noun phrase can be. So I'm gonna say that, uh, so uh, let me go ahead and uh, end this execution right here, uh, and we'll, uh, so uh, I wanted to say that a noun phrase could also involve a noun now, in that, on that um, Wikipedia page, uh, they were using D for determiner, but I think that what I hear from people is that they've heard about that as being called an article. It's kind of more, more commonly used. So the word the, for example, would be an article. Uh, what are other articles? A is an article. And is an article, but I'm actually gonna leave off and because we're not gonna properly distinguish between when to use a and when to use an, and it's a, we get a little more of them right if we just use stick to a, a and don't throw in an. Uh, I mean, this is, this is a crude grammar. It's obviously not a correct grammar, uh, but we can use the word some. So those will be my different articles. And then what I'll say is that another possibility for a noun phrase is that it's an article followed by a noun. And I asked you guys for some nouns, and you gave me a bunch. So let me make a copy of that, and let me put these in here. So let's save this version of it, and then let's run our program again. So we'll come over to Gra Grammar Main, we'll run it, we'll give it fun.txt. And notice now it has new things for article and for noun that it didn't have before. So if I ask for noun phrases, give me five of them, I have Olympia, Ludwig Ogren, a whale, Johnny Bravo, and some paper. So now it's sometimes using the one rule, sometimes using the other rule. 
uh, and if we did sentences, five sentences, we're still getting the VUP kind of problem. So we want to fix that. Okay, well, let's fix what, uh, what a VUP is. What does a verb phrase look like? And what I would say is that you have to remember that there are different kinds of verbs. So there are what are known as transitive verbs. And you know, I had asked the class if you guys were here, what's the difference between transitive and intransitive? Transitive verbs require an object. So you would tend to have a transitive verb followed by a noun phrase versus an intransitive verb. Like an intransitive verb could be laughed. You know, Stuart laughed. Uh, whereas uh, uh, a transitive verb would be something like hit, you know, Stuart hit the nail, you know, something like that. So uh, I'm going to throw in those possibilities and I split up your different verbs into some transitive verbs and intransitive verbs. So I'll throw these things in. That's again uh, things that were suggested by your fellow classmates. Uh, and let's go ahead and save that file and come over here and run it again. And, uh, oops, oh yeah, I, I, had the, I had this old execution going that we needed to end. So uh, how about if uh, we want to use fun.txt. Let's look at some verb phrases and let's see what we got. Now we have coded some toaster, forgot the cat, punched Wilson, escaped, and galloped. Those are the intransitive verbs. So. Uh, how about if I ask for some complete sentences, how about five of them? So we'll see what we get now. So now what we have is Johnny Bravo annihilated some sine wave diagram, India jumped, Thanos disappointed, a sine wave diagram, watched some football, and Ogadugu, I think is how that's pronounced, cried. I'm not sure I pronounced that right, so I apologize. Uh, but uh, so that's an interesting sentence. Okay, let's, let's go ahead and end that one. Uh, I want to throw in some adjectives. And this gets a little bit interesting because what I want to say is that a, uh, a, a noun phrase, in addition to what I have here, could have an article and then it could have an adjective and then it could have a noun. But it can have more than one adjective. So I'm going to put uh, uh, adjective phrase. So. Uh, I, I have some adjectives that you guys gave me, so let me make a copy and put this over here to have the adjective. But what do I do for adjective phrase, colon, colon, equals? Well, it could be a single adjective, or it could be two adjectives, or it could be three, or it could be four, or it could be five. I could put a whole bunch of rules like that, but I mean, I hope you're thinking to yourself, Wait, that's that going down the rabbit hole where I'm not thinking recursively. Well, sure, I can have you know, two adjectives, but what would be the, the recursive way of thinking of this? It could be an adjective followed by an adjective phrase. So that lets you put an indefinite number of adjectives together and still have an adjective phrase. So there could be two, three, four, there could be 100 adjectives, and it would still be considered an adjective phrase. So let me go ahead and save that version, and we'll come over here and run it. And so uh, fun.txt. And now if I ask for some noun phrases, let's take a look at some of those. Uh, some blanket, Olympia, Mogadishu, some glasses. Well, let's try it again. How about some noun phrases? How about if we do 10 this time? And uh, a surprising pencil, some interesting donut. Uh, the enterprise. Anyway, we're, get, we're not getting quite as many adjectives as I would kind of expect, but uh, we're getting some. Uh, let me scooch it up a little bit and we can see, how about if we see 10 sentences? So we get a little bit more interesting. Sam Wilson lived, the alien ran, Michael caught the football, uh, Cow Cow made a curious, great thrilling pen, the soda disappointed, uh, intelligent blanket jump, some calculator escaped, Harry Potter bit a mouse, the calculator learned the Seahawks, and a shield jumped. I'm going to throw in the adverbs that you guys gave me. And I have the ability here to do something slightly different uh, in the case of the adverbs, which is that I can just say that a verb phrase uh, is an adverb followed by a verb phrase. So I can just kind of put an adverb in front. And so if I kind of save this, so may, we've got now kind of our final version here. Let me come back over to grammar main 
and we're going to be cut off soon. But let me try running it with fun.txt. And we want sentences. How about if we look at 20 of them? And we got some.